When we think of architecture and the signature or hallmark visual elements of it, um, we think of the influential architecture of different time periods and different places. We think a lot of columns and capitals, columns being those tall vertical support pillars that hold up uh, porches and porticos and are attached to buildings. But we also think a lot of capitals, which are those very decorative elements that help to join the roof line with the column itself. We think about the function again. Um, columns are vertical support structures. They're present in architecture throughout the world and throughout various time periods. Um, the thing is that uh, we need to also think a little bit about the capitals. The capitals have evolved in different cultures over time and they give us um, a way of identifying the specific time period from which a building was built. Uh, but capitals provide a very important mechanical or engineering function and that's to provide distribution of mechanical stress of support horizontal support beams. If you look back into the ancient world before capitals were being used when there was simply a column there and there was a horizontal lentil uh, or support structure, um, in depending on what part of the world you're in, uh, especially places where there be earthquakes or other kinds of natural disasters, the roofs um, and those uh, beams became um, very fragmented and broken quite often. Early builders figured out that if they were to add some type of plate, or in this case a capital, it would provide the distribution of the mechanical stress. So if you were, for example, in the Aegean Sea area um, off, of, off of the island of Greece and there was an earthquake, um, if you had a capital on top of your column, it would provide uh, a way to minimize damage to the roof of the king's palace, for example. So capitals do provide this very beautiful decorative function, but they provide this important engineering function as well. And we'll be able to see and trace that as we talk. Prior to the Greeks, there was a great deal of work using columns and capitals in other cultures as well. Uh, let's go back, um, let's say about a thousand years prior to the, the Greek use of the decorative capitals. Here we have an ancient Egyptian example uh, in the Ramesseum in Luxor, Egypt. Sometimes the Ramesseum is referred to as being in the city of the necropolis, the city of the dead, which was a city that Ramesses II had constructed during his reign. And this particular example shows beautifully uh, both visually beautifully and also from an architectural engineering standpoint the function of capitals. Here we have the two columns and we have the capital spreading out over a horizontal lentil which is supporting the roof. Notice how that curves uh, and if you can imagine for a moment the weight or the stress is being distributed um, over the entire plate of the capital, the entire top of the capital, focusing it down into the column should there, um, if this were in a different part of the world where uh, they would have earthquakes or other kinds of um, natural disasters, that particular method of distributing the stress and focusing it down into the, into the column was a way to prevent um, breaking the horizontal lentil. Notice the massiveness of this particular structure. Now the Egyptians loved to decorate their capitals in their columns with the lotus and papyrus, which were two very plentiful plants along the Nile. And you see those right here on these particular, um, these particular capitals. But again, this is about 1300 BCE, and it just gives you a good idea of one use of columns and capitals prior to the high art of the classic. Why is there so much made out of this idea of columns and capitals, capitals especially? The reason simply uh, is that it does give us a timeline. It tells us when they were built and created. And there are some distinguishing characteristics as well that have to do with regions. Uh, the names of the classical Greek orders come from the regions or cities that is most closely associated with the formation or the improvement of these particular um, capitals. We have the Doric, the Doric order from 700 BCE from the region of Doria. 
we have the Ionic Order from 550 BCE from the region of Ionia, Greece again. And then we have Corinthian Order, 400 BCE, coming from the great city of Corinth. The city of Corinth in the time of the, of the uh, classical Greeks was the Mecca. It was the New York City. It was where all the arts and culture were happening. It was the center of trade and commerce. And it was very important to the life. Uh, and so um, as time evolved, um, the capitals that were being created in Corinth emulated nature, quite often had floral designs to them, had a beautiful organic thrust to them, and um, worked very nicely in terms of providing what was needed, that structural support that the columns themselves could not not provide fully. They go from the simplest to the most complicated, the Doric is being the simplest at the top, the center illustration you see is the Ionic, and then the one at the bottom is the Corinthian. This particular engraving came from an 18th century French encyclopedia of design and architecture, um, and you can see the um, aspects of these particular orders. You'll notice how, again, it goes from the simplest to the most complex. Now, take a look at the Doric order on the left side. Notice the column that it's sitting on is very plain and round. It was a little bit later that fluting, uh, those vertical grooves, were added to the column to make it more decorative and more peeling. When we get down to the Ionic order, we have um, those scrolls, those volute scrolls, something that we see today on buildings. Um, but we also see them on the peg boxes of string instruments, too. It was a way that the early string makers in the Renaissance period were able to incorporate uh, something very beautiful in their creation of musical instruments. And so today you will see those volute scrolls on musical instruments, such as violins, cellos, violas, on the peg box, which is at the top of the neck. You'll also see these kinds of scrolls on furniture, again, People looked backwards to the Greeks. They saw great beauty, order, and symmetry, all those things that Aristotle thought were beautiful, and they wanted to incorporate that in their particular work. We get down to the Corinthian order. Notice how it incorporates the volute scroll and nature as well, as well as the continuation of the fluting. Now, in addition to the columns and the capitals, there are also pedestals that evolved over time as well. And pedestals gave a chance to have a taller column and um, give you visually bring your eyes up uh, towards uh, the top of the building itself, which was usually the most interesting part. We are now going to uh, watch a brief clip, a video clip, about uh, how some of these particular um, orders and um, we're used to. Before we watch the clip, let's ask ourselves a question. Why would we still want to evoke orders of Greek architecture? And again, the order is the nature of the decoration of the capital, and it's associated with a particular time period and a particular uh, city-state of Greece. Um, the reasons why is because it invokes a sense of history, of lineage, a sense of time, a sense of stability, purpose, and permanence. Those are all things that you want to have in a government building or in a bank or something like this. Um, and we've, as culture, Western European culture, we have lived with these Greek orders being borrowed by the Romans and reestablished by the Romans over time for so long that we expect these particular elements of architecture to show up on our buildings. So let's watch um, this brief video clip about how uh, some of these three orders of architecture are being still used today. Instead of looking at a painting this week, since I'm a little bit pressed for time, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to look at the, the three distinct orders of classical ancient Greek architecture. And the names of those three orders are the Doric, the Ionic, and then later the Corinthian. And those three orders, as I said, were developed in ancient Greece, but they were later adopted by the Romans, which occurred in about the first century BC. And then these three Greek classical orders have consistently since then been used in neoclassical European architecture. And you'll see examples of these columns everywhere. And uh, that's really what neoclassical architecture is. It's incorporating these ancient Greek 
and also ancient Roman classical orders. The Romans adopted the Greek orders and then kind of refined them, but incorporating those ancient styles into modern architecture as well. So look around next time you see a building with columns and see if you can identify uh, which type of order it's based upon. Okay, the first order is the Doric order, and this originated from the mainland and western Greece. And it's the simplest of all of the orders, typically characterized by a, a short, heavy column with a plain, round capital. And there's some terminology associated with uh, architecture, and specifically columns, which I'm going to introduce you to here. The capital is just the rounded top of the column. The Doric columns typically don't have a defined base or plinth. Um, some of them do. Obviously, there's a lot of variation, but traditionally there was no base. And the height was also traditionally only about four to eight times the diameter of the column. So the columns were typically very squat, very fat and short. Of course, like I said, there's a lot of variation on that, and they aren't necessarily always between four and eight times the diameter today, or even back in ancient Greece. But originally, that was what you were going to see. And the shaft, or the, the rounded body of the column, is channeled with 20 flutes, which are those grooves that you see in the side of the column. The Ionic order was distinguished by slenderer than the Doric uh, fluted pillars that had a, a quite a large base as opposed to the Doric order with really no base. A large base and then two opposed volutes or uh, that scroll shape that you see at the top are called volutes in the echinus. And the echinus of a column is just the rounded molding or decorative top portion beneath what was called the abacus, which was the slab that formed the uppermost uh, division of the capital of the column. And the echinus is decorated with what's called an egg and dart motif. And this isn't maybe the best picture, but um, you can kind of see why it would be called an egg and dart motif. That alternating kind of oval or circular shape with that arrow type shape. And the ionic shaft typically came with four more flutes than the Doric. So it had 24 little flutes channeled into the column as opposed to the 20 that we saw in the Doric. And the column of the Ionic Order was typically nine or fewer diameters. And so here's another example. I've kind of been trying to show you uh, an example from classical Greek architecture, um, and then an example in neoclassical architecture. Oh, and I had to throw this in here. This is actually where I go to school. And then the third and final order is the Corinthian, which is the most ornate. And it's characterized by a, another slender fluted column, like the Ionic Order, but it has this very ornate capital, or top, uh, decorated with these two rows of acanthus leaves and scrolls. And here's some detail, maybe, that we can help. The acanthus is a type of plant, um, but it was incorporated into the, uh, the architecture of ancient Greece. Into the shaft of the Corinthian order, like the Ionic, typically also has 24 flutes. And the column is usually a little bit higher than uh, either the Doric or the Ionic, typically about 10 diameters high. So one last thing that I think maybe is worth mentioning is uh, this church, which is remarkable in that it actually shows all three orders of the classical Greek architecture on different levels. The columns on the ground level, the first floor, are Doric, the second level, Ionic, and then on the top, Corinthian. And this is the church of saint gervais saint Prote in France. Anyway, next time you're out and about, Check out some of the columns on the buildings and see if you can identify which classical order they belong to, Doric, Ionic, or Corinth. Have a great week, everybody. Considering some of the uh, influence in our own nation of architecture, if we go back to the time of Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of our country, um, the, um, the architect of the Declaration of Independence, uh, you'll notice that um, there's a diagram here that shows actually five orders of architecture at Monticello. Monticello was his home, and Thomas Jefferson, being the Renaissance-style man that he was, he also um, designed his own home and built it, and he was the chief architect of it. But if you take a look from left to right of the columns and the various capitals and the pedestals that are being used, um, you can begin to see um, how he wish to embrace a great swath of history. On the far left we have the simplest, the Doric style. 
Then we have the Doric style with the fluting on the columns. Notice there's an entablature at the top, you know, some decorative work around the skyline or the roof. Notice how that increases in its complexity as well. The third one from the left is Ionic. Notice that Volute scrolls, um, which are reminiscent um, of, um, of actually the Nautilus shell, uh, a shell that was very common in the Aegean Sea um, off the coast of Greece. And uh, Greek fishermen would be very familiar and Greek people would be very familiar with that, what that scrolling would look like. That's where it comes from. The, the fourth one on the right um, shows a Corinthian order. Notice the, the elaborateness of it. And then the fifth one on the right shows a more of a Roman application of the Corinthian order. The entablature at the top is a little bit more elegant and a little bit more detailed. Um, the pedestal that it stands on is a little higher and the um, the engraved fluting on the columns is a little finer so it's a more refined more evolved kind of order but again we see five orders of architecture that are based on those three classical Greek orders and that uh, that the Romans borrowed also uh, let's take a look at the Acropolis for the moment the Acropolis was the crown jewel of Greece. It was a city that evolved over a great period of time. It was a site of numerous temples. It was a site of trade and commerce. Um, and it was, it was in uh, uh, Athens, Athens uh, being the center of the world at the time. It was uh, built for the most part, or reconstructed in the method that we know today, in the format we know today, by Pericles. And this, this was during the Golden Age of Athens, about 460 to 430 BCE, over about a 30 year period. Most of the important structures that we're familiar with and we think of came from this time period. But again, uh, the Acropolis is a city, a great city that evolved over a great deal of time. Let's take a look at one of the buildings here for a moment, the Temple of Athena Nike, which was constructed uh, over a three-year three, three year period, which was pretty quick in terms of uh, the ancient world, from 427 to 424 BCE. And you will notice that there are two ends to the building. There's an end facing the left, the sunlit area, and then there's another end uh, that is looking out over this, the modern city of Athens and over the countryside. We can't see it, but there are some small statues um, on the side uh, on the side that's facing out towards uh, modern Athens and um, and the countryside. But let's take a look at the columns and capitals. Look at the time period: 427 to 424 BCE. Um, it was approximately a hundred years prior to that that the Ionic order began to be used in Ionia, or developed and evolved in Ionia. Uh, look at the fluting on the columns, but most importantly, look at the capitals and the volute scrolls at the top. Again, this is uh, approximately uh, 75 years after um, the Ionic order evolved in Ionia, and you will see that it's a well-established order, and it was used very appropriately in the Temple of Athena Nike. You would not see the Corinthian order in this temple, and why is that? It's because the Corinthian order evolved in Corinth, which was another famous uh, city-state, but um, began approximately uh, 25 years after this particular temple was built. So the ancient Greeks had the opportunity to use the Doric order and the Ionic order on this temple, but they did not have the opportunity to use the Corinthian order. Another great temple, perhaps the, the most famous one that we are aware of, is the Parthenon. And this was a massive temple to the gods. It was a very broad based theological temple. Um, you look around it today, you see a lot of ruin and rubble from um, ancient stones that were once uh, atop uh, the Parthenon. Um, the part of Greece, and actually the part, the, the Mediterranean in which um, Greece exists um, is fraught with earthquakes and natural disasters over time, unfortunately. 
because of volcanic activity. Uh, the strata and stress plates shift underneath the islands. And so over time, these ancient buildings have been subject to minor and major earthquakes. And so we see a lot of rubble um, around the building that came originally from this particular building. Another interesting thing that happens over time is that um, as centuries and millennium have passed, um, some people have taken items, some of the stonework, and they transported it to other areas uh, so they wouldn't have to go to the quarries to cut new stone. And so actually parts of the Parthenon have been discovered in, in small towns um, around Athens, uh, quite a distance away from the Parthenon where, where that stonework originally came from. But you'll notice the, um, there's a great deal of symmetry and order in the way that this building is presented. Notice the columns, um, how, they, how they stand very tall. But also notice how these columns have a very thick look to them because a great deal of weight is being supported by these columns. Also, you'll notice that there's fluting on the columns. And we're going to take a close-up look at the building. Here's a, a, a closer picture where we can see more of the detail. Some interesting things. If you look at the very top of the roof line, if off to the left, you see some sculpture. That entire uh, entablature roof line up there was decorated with different sculptures, sculptures representing different gods. Underneath, there's another entablature that shows small scenes um, from the lives of the gods. And here we have the columns and capitals themselves. If you look very carefully off to the left, you're going to see what looks like a latticework of some type. It's a scaffolding that was constructed uh, during um, restoration of this particular national treasure, national monument. But you'll notice that it's very plain, very simple, and again, um, because of the time period, the arch the builders decided that they wished to use the um, the older style the Doric style, which actually originated in about 700 BCE and went up all the way to about 550 BCE. They could have incorporated ionic elements, but they chose not to. Um, and again, notice how these particular columns and capitals are constructed. The capital itself is very simple, but notice how the round part of the capital extends to a square plate which connects to the lentil. Again, it helps to relieve all those stress lines and all those uh, potential fractures that would occur during an earthquake or some other type of natural disaster. So to summarize, we have in our focus three main styles of capitals and columns. There's the Doric order from 700 BCE, the Ionic order from 550 BCE, and the Corinthian order from 400 BCE, um, going back to the older times, the most simple, and then becoming more uh, complicated and more evolved, uh, noticing again how the builders were able to bring aspects of nature and plants and decorations into this. And this is uh, part of what the Romans loved about Greek architecture. They loved the, the order and the symmetry of the structures. They loved the decoration, they loved the fluting of the columns, and these are all things that when the Roman society began to evolve and they began building their own structures, they copied the Greeks.